Happy Thursday morning to you guys. It is the 16th of April, episode 16, and today is the day that we finish James and the Giant Peach. And then Miss Kivay has to decide quickly. I keep debating between a couple of stories, so I'll have to figure that out and get us ready for tomorrow. Anyway, let's do our pledge and our motto real quick, and we'll get started. Salute and pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, my kiddos, and here we go. We are students at Peter J. Shields. We believe in kindness. We are responsible. We are persistent. We are respectful. We are bucket fillers. We drop acts of kindness into everything we do. We are Peter J. Shields. And here we go. As always, I hope you guys are doing well. You're adjusting, okay? Oh, look at that panda. I just love the panda. He's so cute. Such a chill animal. Anyway, let's finish with James today, shall we? I have to reach up here to get my book, sorry. And, oh my goodness, only two more chapters. Can't believe it. Where's the time gone? Look at that, just a couple more pages. Chapter 38. So remember, Games has just introduced all of his friends to the New York City Police Chief and uh, Head of the Fire Department. Chapter 38, five minutes later, they were all safely down and James was excitedly telling his story to a group of flabbergasted officials. And suddenly, everyone who had come over on the peach was a hero and they're all escorted to the steps of the city hall where the mayor of New York made a speech of welcome. And while he was doing this, 100 steeplejacks armed with ropes and ladders and pulleys swarmed up to the top of the Empire State Building and lifted the giant peach off the spike and lowered it to the ground. Then the mayor shouted, we must now have a ticker tape parade for our wonderful visitors. And so a procession was formed. And in the leading car, which was the enormous open limousine, sat James and all of his friends. Next came the giant peach itself. Men with cranes and hooks had quickly hoisted it onto a very large truck. And there it now sat, looking just as huge and proud and brave as ever. There was of course a bit of a hole at the bottom of it where the spike of the Empire State Building had gone through it. But who cared about that? Or indeed about the peach juice that was dripping all over into the streets. Behind the peach, skidding all about all over the place in the peach juice, came the mayor's limousine. And behind the mayor's limousine came about 20 other limousines, carrying all the important people of the city. And the crowds went wild with excitement. They lined the streets and leaned out of their windows of the skyscrapers, cheering and yelling and screaming and clapping and throwing out bits of white paper and ticker tape. And James and his friends stood up in their car and waved back at them as they went by. Then a rather curious thing happened. The procession was moving slowly along Fifth Avenue when suddenly a little girl in a red dress ran out in the crowd and shouted, Oh, James, James, can I please have a taste of your marvelous peach? Help yourself, James shouted back. Eat all you want, it won't keep forever. No sooner had he said that than about 50 other children exploded out of the crowd and came running onto the street. Can we have some too? They asked James. Of course you can, James answered. Everyone can have some. The children jumped <clears throat> into the truck and swarmed like ants all over the giant peach, eating and eating to their heart's content. And as the news of what was happening spread quickly from street to street, more and more boys and girls came running from all directions to join the feast. Look at that. They're all so excited. Look at that girl on the rope there, climbing up to get some peach. Goodness, that would be exciting. Soon there was a trail of children a mile long chasing after the peach as it proceeded slowly up Fifth Avenue. Really, it was a fantastic sight. To some people, it looked as though the Pied Piper of Hamlin had suddenly descended upon New York. And to James, who had never dreamed that there could be so many children as this in the world, it was the most marvelous thing that had ever happened. And by the time the procession was over, the whole gigantic fruit had been completely eaten up. The only and only the big brown stone in the middle 
licked clean and shiny by 10,000 eager little tongues, was left standing in the truck. I don't know about you guys, but that doesn't sound very sanitary. But the peach itself sounds delicious. Ah, uh, chapter 39, last chapter. And thus the journey ended. But the travelers lived on. Every one of them became rich and successful in the new country. The centipede was made vice president in charge of sales at a high class firm for boots <laughs> and shoe manufacturers. The earthworm with his lovely pink skin was employed by a company that made women's face creams and to speak commercials. Ugh. That made love that made women's face creams to speak commercials on television. Oh, the silkworm and Miss Spider, after they had both been taught to make nylon thread instead of silk, set up a factory together and made ropes for tight walk walk tight rope walkers. The glowworm became the light inside the torch on the Statue of Liberty and thus saved a grateful city from having to pay a huge electricity bill every year. The old green grasshopper became a member of the New York Symphony Orchestra, where <clears throat> his playing was greatly admired. The ladybug who had been haunted all of her life by the fear that her house was on fire and her children all gone, married the head of the fire department and lived happily ever after. And as for the enormous peach stone, it was set up permanently in a place of honor in Central Park and became a famous monument. But it was not only a famous monument, it was also a famous house. And inside the famous house, there lived a famous person, James Henry Trotter himself. Look at that. And all you had to do any day of the week was go and knock upon the door and the door would always be open to you and you would always be asked to come inside and see the famous room where James had first met his friends. And sometimes if you were very lucky, you would find the old green grasshopper in there as well, resting peacefully in a chair before the fire. Or perhaps it would be the ladybug who dropped by for a cup of tea and gossip or the centipede to show off his new batch of particularly elegant boots that he had just acquired. Every day of the week, hundreds and hundreds of children from far and near came pouring into the city to see the marvelous peach stone in the park. And James Henry Trotter, who once, if you remember, had been the saddest and loneliest little boy that you could find, now had all the friends and playmates in the world. And because there are so many of them, were always begging him to tell the story again and again of his adventures on the peach, he thought it would be nice if one day he sat down and wrote it as a book. And so he did. And that is what you have just finished reading. I love how Roald Dahl ended this story. I think that's just a great way to do this. So if you do not know, there is a movie that goes with this book. It was made in 1996. Give you a little background first. Um, Roald Dahl did not want way back in the 70s, uh, they made the movie Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. He didn't really want his books for movies because he liked the thought of imagination and thinking through. So I hope you guys have enjoyed this story. Um, if you choose, if you have, if you can rent or find, I know there's so much digital stuff, just depends on what you have access. It's kind of interesting to watch the story right after, or watch the movie right after reading the story because you'll see definite similarities. All the characters are there, um, but some differences, even like how the earthworm ended up um, selling face cream here to show his young glowing skin versus um, what he does in the movie. Um, and in the movie, it starts off with a uh, real boy and real people. And then there's this really cool, and I remember this is 1996, so the technology is not what it is here in 2020 or even 2010, because um, it's quite a while ago now. Uh, it's been over 20 years, 24 years. Uh, but there's this really neat scene where when he first discovers the peach, if you remember, when he went back in the garden had grown and he went into the peach and was going through this tunnel, there's a cool transition in the movie where he goes from being a real life boy, you can see that, and they transfer him and it becomes the animation piece. So a majority of it is in the animation piece and then it goes back into um, the, the human quality at the end. So there's definitely some, some differences because sometimes with the movie, you make differences to make the movie a little more exciting. Um, Sometimes what plays out really well in words on a page, the movie isn't as much. I find that uh, books that I like, I 
even if there's a movie that comes out and I'm like, oh, I haven't finished the book, I will finish the book first because I always find that my pictures are different than the movies. Um, and sometimes I have been disappointed in the movies over the years because I'm like, that is not the way it goes. That is not right. Um, so it's just kind of an interesting little, little, little bit. So I am rambling. So with this, I'm just going to make today a short day. I am going to go through my books and try to figure out, I knew I was going to do one story was going to be next. And then I've told you guys, well, maybe another story is going to be next. So I'm still debating between Charlie and Chocolate Factory and Matilda, but then there's a couple other Roald Dahl books that are uh, a little shorter that I might throw in the middle. I'm not sure yet. So tune in tomorrow, Friday, Cliffhanger Friday. The cliffhanger is happening at the beginning. What is Miss Gively going to read next? I have no idea. I just know it's going to be by Roald Dahl because I love his language, the figurative language he has. You can look up words. You can figure out these really difficult words by how descriptive he writes. And I just love it. And it creates wonderful pictures in the heads. And there's usually some, some funny bits. So have a great day. Be safe, take care of yourself, and remember that we love you and care about you, and we cannot wait till we can meet again, but we know that this is um, going to be a long process, and we know that our efforts of social distancing and staying apart are helping, and that's why we want to continue to keep everybody safe and be protected, and we'll just go from there. Love you guys. Have a great day. Thanks again for tuning in, and I will see you tomorrow. Cliffhanger Friday. What's a cliffhanger? What is Miss Kidley reading? I don't know. Anyway, love you guys. Bye.